Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I thought everyone's going to say good afternoon back to me. <laughs> um, I'd like to begin by expressing my deep appreciation to Akidna Giving and to the Center for Universal Education at Brookings for giving me this very valuable opportunity to reflect on my work at the grassroots on adolescent girls' education and to research its impact <clears throat> with some interventions that we launched in rural areas of India. Uh, that's our aim, and uh, you can see the, ge the geographical context that we're in. Um, when we started working on girls' education in the initial years, the barriers were similar to, uh, to barriers in many, many areas uh, particularly rural areas in the developing world, which were child marriage and distant schools that kept adolescent girls from accessing their right <clears throat> to an education. A recent UN study has indicated that 47% of girls in India marry b b before the age of 18. I hope you're shocked. In Maharashtra state, the statistics, the statistics are close to around 35% for child brides. Uh, in the early years, we noticed that uh, <clears throat> many of our girls as young as 12 and 13 were married. And uh, of course, the reason, one of the reasons wa was that schools were distant. But that did not prevent parents from buying bicycles for their sons, because they considered their sons, as you all well know, assets. Unfortunately for girls, they felt uh, buying a bicycle was an unnecessary expense, because uh, you know the girl would eventually get married, and they also would have to pay a dowry. This led us to launch a bicycle bank, which has enabled a thousand girls in our areas to access school. And when we discontinued the intervention, parents realizing the value of educating their daughters began to buy bicycles to send their daughters to school. <clears throat> Merely enabling a girl to access school, we felt, was not enough. Uh, as uh, Christina has just mentioned, life skills education are such a critical core compo component uh, to promote girls' voice and girls' agency. So we added uh, a life skills education program that would promote girls' uh, future well-being in tandem with the Bicycle Bank. Uh, after three years of uh, you know, cycling to school and completing high school, some of our girls came to us and said, can we keep the bicycles? We would like to go on to junior college. We were delighted and launched a scholarship program. And I'm very proud to uh, tell you that more than 1, 1,100 girls have received scholarships. And our village girls have become dentists, engineers, uh, pharmacists, agricultural researchers. They have blown us away. Uh, with increasing incidence of sexual violence, we felt we needed another add-on intervention, and so we started a karate program. Once again, uh, an unintended consequence of this program was that girls started win winning silver and gold medals at uh, not, not just regional, but national and international meets. Um, how did we do this? What was uh, what seemed to be an effectiveness of our interventions. One of the key strategies was engaging the village community, making mothers our allies in this mission to promote girls' education. Please read more about it in my report. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> anecdotal evidence after 15 years had indicated that our va various holistic need-based interventions had uh, to promote adolescent girls' uh, education had been effective in arresting child marriages and promoting educational outcomes. However, in all these 15 years, we had not conducted any research. The Echidna Fellowship 
gave me an opportunity to fill this evidence gap for which I am extremely grateful. We conducted a survey <clears throat> in six villages, three Ashtanukai villages and three control villages. I hope I have the right slide. Uh, two target groups uh, were interviewed, unmarried girls aged 13 to 19, and the other girls 20 and above uh, who had been married in the last five years. Since they were in very different villages, we interviewed their mothers uh, to get the information. These were the findings. <clears throat> married girls, for, for married girls, the mean age of marriage for Ashtanokai girls was 19, as compared to when we started 15 years ago, uh, around 12 or 13. Uh, another finding was that Ashtanukai married girls had 1.7 times greater high school completion rates compared to their peers in the control group. Moreover, 45% of Ashtanukai married girls had completed their desired level of education as compared to 16% in the control group. And significantly larger numbers of married girls in Ashtanukai villages were engaged in income generating activities. The findings for the married girls, the most important finding was that the longer we, uh, the girl, you know, uh, experienced the bicycle bank intervention and the life skills, the greater was the impact. The earlier she experienced the, these two interventions, again, the greater was the impact. Uh, also, Ashtanukai girls were four times more likely to complete high school when exposed to both interventions. They also completed grade, a much higher number of uh, our girls in our villages completed grade 12 as compared to those in the control group. Uh, it was very clear that these simple low cost interventions that we had initiated to promote adolescent girls education had made a difference in many girls' lives, had given them opportunities that their mothers and grandmothers could never have dreamed of. We also did, uh, conducted case studies, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have time uh, to uh, give you a, a, a much greater overview of what we found, <coughs> but uh, we did find that the life skills education component was very critical in giving girls voice and agency. One of the uh, girls we interviewed, a very simple village girl who is now 23, she describes herself as her, the trajectory of her life as from zero to hero. What made a simple village girl uh, get a degree in instrumentation engineering uh, 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 you know, I didn't even know what instrumentation engineering was until she enrolled in it. Uh, and uh, what has made her become a sales executive in a Dutch company? So, uh, uh, you know, how did this happen? We will perhaps discuss later in the panel. Uh, we interviewed four girls, but here I'd just like to present uh, two cases. The other girl, Bharati, she is aiming for the sky you know, Urvashi's book, Reaching for the Sky, she's literally doing that. She wants to become a district collector, which is like the CEO of an entire district, someone who, uh, you know, takes care of the entire administration and revenue of an entire district. Where do, you know, where do village girls get these high aspirations? What is it that makes them uh, reach for the sky? Please read my book or maybe uh, a working paper. So, uh, in conclusion, from our small-scale, modest experiment in promoting girls' education at the grassroots, it is very clear that giving girls wings to fly unlocks their potential and they literally reach for the sky. My appeal to everyone in this room who has the same mission is give girls a chance, help them achieve their aspirations, make education a reality for all, for every last girl in every village, in every city, in every country of the world, 
our future, yours and mine, depends on it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to call all the panelists to the stage. is getting mic'd up. Um, Armin, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it's so clear that there have been impressive uh, outcomes of your interventions, and I think your program has really illustrated for us the importance of thinking both beyond the girl as well as how to engage her mother, her mother as ally, or mothers as allies, um, and really helps frame our discussion today. So, um, as we're getting mic'd up, um, I was thinking, in, you know, maybe our th three other panelists can also introduce a little bit of their work, um, and maybe talk a little bit about kind of the skills that you're all, you all are targeting, um, the population of girls and young women that you're targeting, and um, how they work, and then we can we can launch into a deeper discussion. So maybe I'll start with you, Isa, and we'll go down. Um, so thank you, Christina, and thank you, Armin, for a wonderful presentation, and to the Brookings Institution for having us. Um, so I'm Isa Tujalo. I work for um, BRAC USA, and I'm the lead on um, our everything adolescent development related, um, especially work uh, work with girls um, around the world. Um, BRAC itself is. Uh, an, um, an NGO that started out of Bangladesh in the 70s, um, right after the Civil War and then the cyclone that followed. Uh, it's by many measures the, probably the largest organization um, NGO in the world. Uh, we have, we, um, we do a lot of innovation around um, poverty, poverty eradication and also a lot of work with social enterprise. But I think we are um, most known for our work, um, our community engagement, our community-based work. Um, but also um, our programs that we launched sort of at scale. Um, so far, we've reached uh, over 120 million people, um, most of them women. Our work with um, adolescent um, development revolves around girls, and the starting point for us is that adolescents are the most powerful agents of change in, an, in all the communities that we work. We work primarily with girls um, between the ages of 13 to 22, it fluctuates depending on um, the context that we're in. in. In humanitarian context, we tend to go a little bit younger. Um, and we do so, we work with them by providing, we start off with a safe space where we provide um, access to mentors, we provide access to, um, we, pro we provide life skills training, livelihood training. Um, but key to all of that is sort of, we help build um, social capital for girls and also financial capital. All right, well, thank you all for the opportunity to speak here. My name is Abby Bukovalis. I'm here from Sesame Workshop, which is the nonprofit organization behind Sesame Street. And I assume many of you are familiar with Sesame Street or some of our international work. Um, I work in the part of the company that really focuses on work that is likely to require philanthropic support in order to be sustained. So most of our work is concentrated <coughs> in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, um, currently, there's quite a bit of work going on in the Middle East region, and we work a bit in Latin America as well. And really, you know, what we're doing beyond kind of the broadcast television that folks are most familiar with is developing programming for children who are, they tend to be ages three to seven years, although in certain contexts we do skew older than that, up to nine, ten years old. Um, and. And basically, their, their network. So we're looking at their educators, whether those are educators in a formal school setting or in community settings, as well as their parents and other caregivers. 
in terms of what that means for girls is even when we do uh, programming that we consider to be girls education or girls empowerment programming, we're really thinking about you know, what do boys need in order to meaningfully engage in, in girls education. And at least as importantly, what do parents and caregivers and, and teachers need in order to support girls as they learn to aspire and to have big dreams and to take the very first steps towards achieving those dreams. So just generally a little bit of background of what that means when we're thinking about children who are so young. We're generally looking at an integrated curriculum that considers lots of what we would call foundational skills. And we're thinking about early academic skills that, you know, it's just sort of the, the early literacy, early numeracy skills that help children to succeed in formal school settings. We're thinking about health education. So what are some, what is some of the health knowledge and what are the health behaviors that can help to keep children and families healthy and, and ready to learn? and also the social emotional wellness, social emotional wellness of, of girls and boys and their communities. And in terms of concrete skills that fall into the area of, of, um, of social emotional wellness, we're thinking about resilience, we're thinking about you know, positive, proactive conflict resolution and how from a very early age we can help children to sort of have the agency to, to stand up for themselves and to negotiate and to kind of navigate some of the, the daily challenges of their lives together. So, um, you know, I look forward to talking a bit, a bit more about some of the programs that we do in particular, but that's a, a starting point. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm so honored to be like, part of the panelist um, with, among my colleagues, and then, uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity. My name is Yuki Sakurai. Um, I'm the chief of um, adolescent development participation section in UNICEF Nepal. I'm currently based in UNICEF headquarters in New York, so that's why I didn't travel all the way from Kathmandu, <laughs> um, 16 hours. So, um, I just came from New York. But um, as you probably know, like UNICEF has been working um, for and with children. Um, normally, like it's 0 to 18, but um, we strengths are much more now on the adolescent age group which we targeted 10 to 19. And um, we do have like different approaches as you probably know like health, education, child protection, social protections, many different areas um, for um, supporting um, adolescent and children. Um, specifically in UNICEF, um, we do have like three big pillars. So one is um, supporting enabling environment, especially like setting the policies or guidelines or um, national um, framework for adolescent girls and boys. And second one is um, service delivery. And then this is more like working with other sectoral colleagues, um, as I said, um, education sectors, health sectors, or child protections or communication, so that like, um, adolescent boys and girls can receive um, age appropriate and also um, gender responsive services. Um, the third pillar is about the social norm change. So it's more like community work and, and how we want to break um, some of the social norms, gender norms, or something like um, harmful social practices which is surrounded by adolescent girls and boys. Um, when we started our program in Nepal, um, we did have a deprivation index survey or like we did have like some research um, in order to reach the most marginalized adolescent populations. So um, in Nepal currently, we do have a 75 district, but it's narrowed down to 15. And then out of 15, we did a little more research and then we targeted for six district. Um, so that is the direct intervention. But at the same time, um, most of our work as UNICEF, we work on um, adolescent development through system strengthening approaches. So we work with the partners, we work with the uh, government of Nepal um, to make more adolescent friendly environment uh, creations. Um, it was interesting because we do have some um, social um, and financial skills um, training developed by UNICEF, but at the same time with the partners and the government partner included. 
and I was talking to um, <laughs> Isa, uh, and then we just realized that, like, yeah, I had a discussion with Balak, like, probably a year ago. And then Balak is now starting the implementation of the training pr program. So this is like what I mean for system strengthening. Like out of like 75 district, UNICEF, um, my section is only working for six district, but this program is made um, through the consultation with the partners. So now like many partners taking that program and say it's include like Save the Children, Care, Oxfam, Barak, and then other like local um, NGOs or community-based NGOs, so that like um, it's going to be expanded the program so much. Um, our program is aiming at the strengthening adolescent social um, financial skills and then knowledges. And then I would like to talk about like a little bit more about the deep in depths of the project. Um, just to mention um, the uh, inclusion of boys. Um, when we developed the program, we had like over 100 consultations with adolescents, boys and girls, both included, and then adult stakeholders. And the boys strongly uh, showed interest, saying that like we want to be involved as well. We are also the future of the country. We are also responsible for the girls and then also women in the society. And then girls say the same, like we want to have a boys because if we don't have the boys um, understanding or approval, like we can't make the agenda forward. So can we make it both like boys and girls program? So that's why like we don't target just only girls, but also we target for boys. Thank you, Yuki. Armin, in terms of continuing this line of thought of actual specific interventions and approaches, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to those specific, the, the Bicycle Bank, the Life Skills Education programs, and what knowledge, skills, and attitudes you were trying to target um, in your approaches? Yeah, thank you for the question, Christina. Uh, what we, where the base where we started from was, what do girls need? If they need to, wheels of change, let's give it to them. Uh, adolescence is a very vulnerable, a very critical stage in a, in a girl's life. And uh, I think if we don't uh, catch girls at this very pivotal stage, you know, to help them transition, uh, particularly from primary to secondary school. We've seen, uh, you know, you've read all these numbers of these huge enrollments. You know, in India, I think it's like 98, 99% of girls are enrolled in primary school. But what happens after seventh grade when primary school ends? They tend to drop out, and that's where we need to lift them up and make sure they, uh, you know, they transition on. Uh, so uh, our interventions were basically, you know, uh, very simple, uh, no-brainer type of interventions. Uh, uh, a girl in our villages got pregnant, and a uh, very young girl. Uh, she didn't know how until it was too late. And that's when we realized what we need to do is to uh, introduce uh, uh, life skills education to give girls uh, information on sexuality, on reproductive health, uh, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, when, you know, uh, for example, uh, the scholarship program, if, you know, girls, let's say, finished high school, uh, that would have been the end because parents would not pay for them to continue on to uh, further education. But since they, des you know, here girls had these aspirations. And so we felt it is our responsibility to help support these aspirations. Uh, and then, you know, sexual violence in India is a huge problem. So if we could uh, implement a very simple intervention like a karate program, uh, you know, it would help girls not only to, you know, um, to learn self-defense skills, it would help in their empowerment process, you know, to feel they can take care of themselves. They can take control of their lives to some degree. And uh, your second question? Um, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes, but you've covered some of that. The, yeah. about the knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So what, you know, what were the kinds of things that we wanted girls to learn? Uh, I, I must confess that I have no background in international development or social uh, work, or et cetera. We, we were just working from what do the girls need, you know? Uh, the girls need to, to, to know the laws. The girls need to know that all these stereotypical uh, images, uh, roles that they're, you know, 
uh, told to play as uh, mothers and, you know, uh, as, sorry, as uh, uh, wives and mothers, they, they can sort of transform that. So uh, we needed to change gender norms. We needed to give girls uh, information on not just, you know, um, the daily things that they needed to, that were relevant to their lives, but also uh, skills in decision making, skills in negotiation. And how did we do that? We had these, we built women's centers, which is something I learned from Japan, where I spent many years. Uh, the Japanese, uh, in many places, built women's centers where women could just be who they wanted to be. And so we felt, well, we need to build these women's centers, not just for women, but also for the girls. So the girls would come in, and in the life skills education classes, the facilitator would, um, you know, would have topics that were taboo, uh, like, for example, menstruation or sexuality or, uh, or dowry you know, uh, or sexual violence that nobody would talk about in school or at, at home. But these were issues they needed to confront, they needed to think about, they needed to question, they needed to form opinions about them. So we had these discussions where girls were given a chance to uh, you know, give voice to their feelings, where they uh, you know, could learn that women were as equal as men, and you know, women could do anything that men could do, et cetera. Uh, and so I, I hope I'm not going over my time. But uh, uh, basically, we wanted girls to be who they want to be, you know, give them that, uh, that feeling that, they, that they're, uh, they're valued, you know, their opinions are important, uh, you know, to raise their self-esteem, et cetera. That's what we tried to do in the life skills education. But I'm hoping to learn a lot from Christina's paper today. <laughs> Thank you, Hermine. That I can incorporate. Okay. Thank you. So each of your programs and organizations are focusing on distinct and oftentimes overlapping um, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. But I think, as, I've, as I mentioned earlier today as well, our focus isn't really necessarily on the skills themselves, but on how girls are enabled to translate those skills into more empowered action and how those skills can help lead to and catalyze wider social change. So I'm really curious to hear from each of you, how are you all thinking about going beyond the girl how are you really achieving some of these wider goals, even though you're focusing on the girls specifically? And many of you are talking about community engagement and um, other, other actors that you're engaging with. Um, maybe, Isa, let's start with you and uh, with Breck. Right. Um, so uh, to start off, our flagship um, adolescent development program that focuses um, primarily, if not exclusively, in some areas on girls is the Empowerment and Livelihood for um, Adolescents program short form ELA, you hear me talk about ELA, so I just wanted to get that out there. Um, so at BRAC, we think of um, girls empowerment as the expansion of uh, girls' ability to sort of make strategic choices in her own life. Um, right now, the decision-making ability is, 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 is shrunk. It's very limited for girls globally um, due to factors like high unemployment rate, it's uh, child marriage, um, young uh, child, childbearing, and all of these things sort of restrict their options and sort of increase um, their dependence on, uh, on men uh, in some instances and other harmful um, societal sort of structures. Um, so what we do in ELA is um, we try to expand their options. And we do so sort of by providing them with safe spaces for them to coexist and um, and interact and build social capital. We try to provide uh, life skills training. We provide um, tools for financial empowerment. Um, but to a large extent, we also work with, um, uh, with the larger community, mm -hmm. whether it is the power structures within the village that the girl lives or the business structure within which the girl, the girl lives. And then she's then able to access these power, power structure through the clubs, through the safe spaces, through the group that she's now a part of that is a powerful group. Um, I guess um, as an individual, you're less powerful, but with a group, you can find your voice, that sort of thing. Um, and throughout our work, 
what we really found uh, with the ELA program is that not only does it give um, positive impacts on the girls themselves uh, on various levels by increasing their likelihood of earning income, by decreasing rates of pregnancies where we work, by um, decreasing um, early entry into marriage and cohabitation, and very importantly, the number of girls reporting looks sort of having sex against their will, um, but they also, as the girls sort of start their own businesses, prove themselves to be credit worthy in their communities, we find that they also change the communities within which they live because they're empowered, they're able to, um, in an actionable way, and they're able to show um, the different sort of power brokers in the communities that they live, that they have a voice um, and they can take care of themselves. Thank you. I like how you mentioned a lot about power. I hope we yeah. can get into that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Yuki, can I maybe ask you to talk a little bit about um, Repentaran and um, sort of the ecological model that you all sure. use there? Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Um, it's interesting, like I was mentioning about, like, you know, a group of um, adolescents getting together. Um, before we start the program, we did have the baseline surveys with um, 15 districts um, in Nepal. Uh, what was quite interesting and striking is that, like, when the boys are getting older, um, they do have more friends. Um, we ask some questions, like, if you have, like, very sensitive topics which you can't discuss with your parents, how many friends can you discuss about this. Or if you really need money, if you can't borrow friends, how many friends can you ask? Uh, very simple questions. And then boys said like, you know, um, they have more um, um, friends when they get older. But obviously, um, um, interestingly, um, girls said um, they have like fewer friends when they get older. And we ask the questions, the group of um, age group of 10 to 14, first and then 15 to 19. So all of them are in the adolescent age. And this was something like we are very strike and then saying like, okay, we need to do something for the girls. They need to have a space. They need to meet together and then see like how they can improve the friendship or uh, some activities outside of um, house or school. So this is like something like um, coming up and then among other various um, data we collected. We just came up with um, uh, ecological model. I didn't realize like the room is so big and then I didn't have a means of printing like a bigger one, but um, this is like a <laughs> very small, I'm sorry, and then I don't know if you can see it, but like it's at least have colors. <laughs> Hopefully you can pick it up. So we always want to put adolescent as a center. And then we want to see what are the immediate surrounding environments which they have or they are in. So mothers and fathers, they are always like very influential to adolescent life. And then also like, um, Nepal is like very religious countries by different religions, Buddhist, um, Hinduist, um, Hinduism, and also Muslims as well, and then indigenous religions. So like religious leaders has very powerful in the community to make some of the decisions and then also having like 2,000 years of social norms, surroundings. And then also um, we do have like teachers, um, the service providers who is providing health services, for example, child protection services. Um, we do have like a lot of local medias because um, they don't have many TVs, but they do have like community radios. So like radio is not like national as the states or in Japan, but it's more like a local radio surrounded by communities. So that is like immediate surroundings which influence um, adolescent life. And then like the yellow is a little bigger. It's more like a policy level, like what nation is doing for adolescent. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, UNICEF um, works for like different dimensions. So um, when it comes to the um, environment, like what uh, the nation is doing for adolescents? Like do we have our legislations? Um, and then is it like um, in real? So for example, like Nepal government recently changed their um, age of marriage from 16 to 20. And then we said like, uh, is it really? Like <laughs> even like 16, they get married at the age of 12, 10. And then does it make any changes? But this is something like we need to bring and an advocate to the government as well. Like, 
what kind of legislation we need, what kind of policy we need, and how we want to activate that policy into like their uh, real life in the community. At the same time, the services, um, do we have enough capacity for health workers who can provide age-appropriate gender-responsive um, services? We want to build the capacity. And then also, um, we do have a parenting programs. And normally, like when it comes to early childhood development, um, parenting is very important. But at the same time, in the second decade of life, we really think like um, parents' orientation and training is important <laughs> because this is the time like uh, adolescent boys and girls change dramatically their bodies and then also in the mind as well. So are the parents ready to accept all the changes and then also uh, they have a skills as well as adolescent to negotiate or to talk or to um, you know, have a discussion with adolescent kids, teen kids. And then we just <coughs> found probably this is something like important to build their capacity as well as adolescent girls and boys' capacity. So this is how um, we work. And we do have like other components like working with local medias, uh, working with religious, religious leaders, and then they are really powerful. And then one boy said, like, no, I'm not going to accept any child marriage in my community. Let's stop. Right? So in a sense, like, we need to work with different surroundings and different stakeholders in the community at the same time, national or local level. Thank you, Yuki. Your point about, um, you know, really thinking about how as, as girls go into adolescence and their social networks decrease and just the ability to have spaces where they can voice their issues or voice their concerns just decreases dramatically. I think it's really key for us to think about um, sort of the beyond the, the individual girl issue. And your ecological model, hopefully others can, can look at it at some, po some point in time, really points to those key multiple layers that surround the girl um, that we try to also talk about in terms of context, just what are those enabling environments and those enabling contexts mm -hmm. that need to be considered. So thank you. Thank you. Abby. Um, can you tell us a little bit how Sesame Workshop is t tending to this larger social systemic change simultaneously, while, while simultaneously focusing on the individual's uh, skills development? Sure, sure. So I think what I'll, what I'll speak about first a little bit is our mass media content. And I'm going to qualify it a little bit because I think most of the people in this room are probably most familiar with, with the broadcast television that Sesame Street does. But we recognize that you know, we're reaching a subset of people when we're thinking about broadcast television who has access to, to broadcast in many of the places where we're working. And so I'm just going to flag a couple of other ways that we um, try to produce content for mass media and then reach people who don't necessarily have a television at home. Um, one thing that we do are mobile community viewings, where basically we take an episode or multiple episodes of television that were intended for broadcast, and they will be hooked up to a rickshaw or a motorbike or a repurposed vegetable cart and actually moved from community to community so that folks who don't necessarily have electricity or a television in the home can come out and have sort of a facilitated viewing experience. Obviously, that has limited reach as well, but it goes beyond the reach of broadcast television, and it really does help to, you know, to, to bring the content to, to young children and, and caregivers who might not otherwise have access. The other thing that we do that we don't do in the U.S. is um, radio programming. So in India and South Africa and Afghanistan in particular, we have pretty extensive radio programs that feature the same characters, the same Sesame characters that you might see on broadcast television, but instead, you know, it's done for radio. And um, I think, as, um, as Yuki mentioned, that many of these radio stations are local stations. So, you know, it's, it's the station that a community or a couple of communities tune into. But through the networks that, that our media partners have, we are able to get incredible coverage. And particularly, um, you know, in, in Afghanistan, it's been pretty incredible. There's very remote communities that do have access to our local version of, of Sesame Street's programming through local radio stations. So that's very exciting. And then just speaking a little bit more about sort of the capacity of, of broadcast to aim to influence social norms, um, you know, there are, I sort of broke down 
like three main things that I think that, that we try to do when we're thinking about you know, what's gonna actually go out in mass media. This tends to be one direction. You know, it's sort of like, it's not, it's not an interactive experience necessarily, so we're really trying to get it right. And everything's done quite intentionally. So the first thing that I want to mention is our Muppet character development and mm -hmm. how, how, critical, how critical the character development is for our programs. And when we're thinking about you know, who are the characters that are going to represent you know, the hopes and the realities of, of children in a given country and what do we want them to look like, it's very much an iterative and a collaborative process with um, Sesame teams that are based in country with um, producers, with educators, with researchers. And we're really trying to create characters that are going to resonate and that stand for the sorts of values that we're hoping uh, we'll be able to, to communicate and that um, the values that are sort of represented by our, our curriculum and our, education of, our educational objectives. So um, I can definitely speak a little bit more about that. But what we're able to then do is to take those characters, and I'll use um, one particular example, is a little six-year-old girl character named Zari, who is on our show in Afghanistan. And we're able to take Zari, and uh, ultimately, um, a year later, her, her new little brother, who's around three or four years old, and his name is, is Zirak, and we're able to incorporate them into storylines that reflect you know, and, and challenge some of, some, some of the gender norms. Um, and we're able to use these characters in some cases to address topics that might be quite sensitive to address with, with humans. Uh, and we have a little bit more flexibility and they feel a little bit less threatening when they are challenging norms. So what we do with Zuri and Zirak, for example, is Zuri is older, so she goes to school. And Zirak can't wait till he's a big kid like, like Zuri is so that he can go to school as well. But just showing and, and modeling this idea that little boys can look up to girls and that girls can be the, the, role, model who, the role model who is attending school, that's something that we're really trying to do in all of our storylines. And when it's possible, when it is maybe a little bit less sensitive or when it's sometimes a little bit more of a complicated message, we also do live action films which, which feature children from the, the target countries, the target communities, sort of challenging norms in similar ways. And that might include showing a boy who's helping to clean a classroom, even though that tends to be uh, a girl's role or something like that. And we just we create all of these storylines in a way where we're trying to challenge some of the norms that kids might be exposed to in their regular lives, whether at, at home or in the community or, or at school. And then the final thing that I wanted to mention about our broadcast programming is um, that we really always uh, try to keep co-viewing in mind. And that's ultimately our goal is that parents are going to watch these shows or listen to these shows with their children. So I'm sure if, if uh, any of you ever see US Sesame Street, there's all sorts of spoofs from, from movies that mm -hmm. your kids haven't watched, but that you've watched. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, you know, there's celebrities that kids don't recognize, but that you recognize. And all of that is just, uh, it's really a very conscious attempt to get parents to engage with, with the program as their children are watching it. And we do know from research, and even specifically from research in Afghanistan, that when co-viewing happens, when parents are sitting down and watching the program with their kids, we actually see a greater educational impact. So we see more significant learning outcomes among children who get to watch the program with their parents compared to those who are watching alone. And you know that's that's definitely something that that we're really trying that we're really trying to do, and that gives us some nice anecdotal evidence uh, in in many areas, but specifically in girls' education, where we have heard from fathers and uncles who have started to shift their perceptions around the values of sending young girls to to preschool or to early primary school. Thank you, Abby. Mm -hmm. You know what's really interesting is that each of our panelists have approached this wider systemic social change component of, of girls empowerment in very, very diverse ways. Um, especially thinking about um, you know how do you target these uh, wider changes in a more holistic way, um, whether it's through co-viewing or in some way involving um, thinking about government policy and, and other media and other religious leaders or, or so on. 
Um, what it sounds like, um, and just trying to pull out the threads, what it sounds like is that we're really talking about the interplay between opportunity structures and the girls' agency, and particularly the, that relational agency piece, right? Um, the part that is dependent on whether others in the community recognize that she has agency and that she can control and choose her own um, actions and choices. So um, maybe, maybe we'll go back to Armin. Um, Ashino Kai really aims to develop girls' agency, uh, their voice, um, their ability to aspire. Um, in your qualitative evidence, you found that your interventions made huge strides in expanding girls' uh, possibilities, their aspirations, their dreams. Um, can you tell us a little bit of what you think might have been some of those key ingredients that really activated some of those internal um, development of agency? Uh, Christina, can I start with the external? Because without the support of mothers, you know, uh, in all the case studies that uh, we did, in the four case studies we did, mothers played a very key role. So, um, however much the girl, we, we could develop the girl's, uh, you know, voice and agency, self esteem, et cetera, without the mother's support, I don't think uh, the girl could have gone uh, very far. So I, I just want to sort of uh, mention that. Uh, what, what we tried to do was uh, create a supporting, supportive, enabling environment for the girl. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in, you know, um, in all the, the various interventions, we tried to capture the girls at tipping points when they might you know, uh, fall through the cracks. And in terms of giving voice and agency, uh, for example, many of the girls had so many misconceptions and misinformation about adolescence, you know, about menstruation, uh, all these social taboos. And so helping to demystify uh, some of this, uh, you know, helped girls a lot. Uh, it, it helped girls to feel, uh, you know, they, they were not strange or they were not... Uh, 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 I'm not quite articulating uh, what I want to say. It, it helped girls to feel that, uh, you know, uh, they're like all other girls, you know, they're no different. And also, uh, the, the one other thing in our, um, uh, in our quanti uh, qualitative study was the importance of role models. So, uh, for example, in the case of Tai, you know, a zero to hero girl, she uh, had these role models that you know, she aspired to be like. Uh, one of her seniors was doing, uh, 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 you know, was studying instrumentation engineering, and so she thought, gee, she can do it, so can I, you know. So uh, I, I think the, uh, I, I hate to bring this very, uh, you know, this yes I can, uh, Obama's, uh, you know, uh, phrase, but that's, you know, that's what we wanted to give the girls the ability to, to feel. And the role model, uh, you know, it certainly helped girls to feel that way. Um, Some of the other key ingredients. Um. Um, I'm trying to, th trying to think. Um, I think they all mentioned that in the life skills education program sessions, they just felt that they learned so much and that they could critically reflect on this. And the, we, had a, we had facilitators who were, community, who were our community workers who were trained to run these programs. And uh, they felt very comfortable, uh, not only uh, in thinking about this and learning about you know, how to negotiate and all this, but they actually would perform skits where they would take these to the village community to help uh, you know, the, the village community change gender nor norms. You know, for example, they would do skits on dowry and you know, child marriage and to sort of uh, portray the negative effects of uh, these uh, terrible cultural practices. So um, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think. Um, girls, you know, girls had a space. They had a, a feeling that, you know, that we were helping to build their capacity so that they could uh, control their lives in the future. 
you know, we tried to expand their world. We, we had overnight camps. We had exposure trips. Uh, we took them to the police station, you know. We told them about rape laws. So uh, this kind of, uh, you know, opening uh, the world of a village girl who generally, in, in an average uh, village in India, in a rural setting, she does not, once she's reached puberty, she does not leave the four walls of her home. Uh, and once she gets married, also, she rarely does that. Uh, and I, again, I want to come back to the, you know, to our uh, interventions with the, with the village community. Once we made mothers our allies, the ripple effect extended to the, to the, to the fathers. And one strategy, uh, this is not about empowering, but I, I want to share this. One strategy we used was to uh, make mothers financially uh, not quite independent, but uh, to give them, you know, livelihood interventions. And once their income increased, they were uh, our allies because, you know, they, they believed in us that we were trying to improve the quality of their lives. And so they were very instrumental in helping us to transform the lives of, uh, of girls. And once, uh, you know, once the village community, we also brought in microcredit, and so on. So uh, ours was uh, is a kind of uh, I, I would like to again use that word holistic. We've got we're, we're targeting not just the girl, but uh, the mother primarily because she holds the key to you know uh, uh, to supporting and promoting the girl's aspirations, the girl's education, etc. So and we did this through you know uh, financial. Uh, sort of upliftment for the for the mothers. We also did uh, supported the girls, so it was a kind of not quite as uh, holistic as uh, Yuki San uh, suggested, but we tried in our own way to kind of give the girl an enabling and supportive environment in in every way we could. Thank you. Yuki, maybe turning to you that, then, um, UNICEF Nepal's Rupantran program also aims to um, influence or enhance the skills that girls have to influence decisions that are uh, critical in their life trajectories, including um, <coughs> points in which they might be uh, meeting moments of early marriage. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe discuss a little bit about how Rupantran is um, thinking about and actually addressing the development of her agents, of right. girls' agency. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's very interesting point. Just before going to um, the uh, what's the program about Rupantran, I just wanted to mention about like agent versus agencies. So like in Nepal, um, quarter of adolescent uh, girls get married before age of 18, so 24 percent something. So it's quite high. And the girls, um, child marriage program is getting a lot of attention, and then it's very multi-sectoral approaches. But um, are we aiming to have a program who's, um, which stop the marriage at the age of 18? Or do we want to increase the agency of adolescent girls who make the decision saying that, like, I don't want to get married at the age of 18? So when it comes to um, like child marriage program, like um, UNICEF Nepal, and then also personally myself said like, no, we don't want to fight for the age. We want to fight for the agencies. We want to increase the agency of the adolescent girls who can make the decision. So um, as um, I mentioned, um, based on the baseline surveys, um, we came up with the Rupantaram program. Uh, Rupantaran in Nepali um, means um, transformation in English. So we want to make the girls and boys transformed um, throughout this program. So how it works is um, we do have 15 modules um, in the social and financial skills. And um, I can't um, list it all, but um, it started with my world or self-awareness, rights and responsibility. So we want to make sure that girls know who they are, where are their surroundings, what is it, um, what they are having. And then it goes to some of the topics. So um, we talk about like nutrition, um, um, fast aid, civic engagement. Um, and then some of the things is the financial literacy, like savings and spendings. So um, we do have like very comprehensive, these 15 modules, uh, mostly conducted through peer-to-peer um, -peer, um, methodologies. Um, I just want to just read um, my story. Um, this is the quotation from one of the participants in our program. 
So she says, um, if my father can no longer um, assist me my education, I will use the money from my saving account and continue my education and then achieve my goals in the life. So um, I was quite impressed for this, and then translation might be like giving a little bit more, <laughs> but um, still I, I feel like this is like really powerful. The reason why I say it's powerful is that like it has a lot of different competencies and then skills and then knowledge she used in the sentence. So what it means like she knows who she is, uh, where she is, or like what surroundings she is having. Um, also, she knows like what she wants to be, how she wants to be in the future. Um, at the same time, she mentioned about like she wants to continue her study from her savings. It's just coming from the topics of savings and spending, right? And then uh, finally, like she is negotiating with her father, meaning that like she needs to have some kind of empowerment herself. Plus, she is confident in negotiation or communication with the father. So it's in one sentence, this is something like we are trying to do. Like we want to increase the agency of adolescent girls in different dimensions. And probably one is not enough. But like giving different competencies all together, she might be able to fight or negotiate uh, with father or like the surroundings she has. Um, Again, um, I think like it's very interesting to see like gender um, aspect as well, um, especially in Nepal context. So when we go to the field, asking the girls, um, even like the participating um, the girls to our program, I ask the questions. So do you think um, that um, there is like any differences between boys and girls? Do you think like you are treated differently? And most of the time, at the beginning, the girls said. Well, I don't think so. Like I'm treated quite well. Like, mm. and then I was asking the questions more um, to hear from them, like what it means, like treated equally or like the same, because I don't have the sense for that. And then um, what they say is that like I go to school as my brother, and then I ask another question. So your brother is going to private school, and you're coming to public school. And then she was like, Yeah. And then she start thinking like, okay, this might be like something different. And then I asked her um, or them, like, what do you do when you go back home? And then they said like, well, I help my mother or grandmother. And I asked them like, so what your brother does? And then they said like, well, they play football or cricket. And then I'm challenging them again. Like, so do you think like boys and girls are treated well, the same? And then they are like, hmm. Maybe <laughs> not, you know. So in a sense, like the gender norms or social, cultural, like normative structure is so deep in their mind. So even if we don't provoke or like even if I provoke, they don't realize it. So this is something like we need to break through. We just don't want to give the skills and knowledge, but also we challenge the society. And it might be difficult for them to start thinking first. And then it might challenge themselves a little bit in different way or difficult way at home or school. So we need to have, again, I come back to the comprehensiveness. We need to have a support mechanism. And then if they face something difficult, like where they can go, where, who they can talk. So we need to create the supporting system together. Otherwise, they might feel that like they are so empowered, but nobody listened to them and then they might hurt themselves or they stop learning because this is not giving them like meaningful life. So I think like in terms of agency, I think it is very important to have like two dichotomy, as you mentioned, opportunity, plus the agency, what, what does it mean agencies and what are the competency they need in the cultural context? Yeah, I mean, a great example about the need to support girls to be able to read their context, read gender, and read power, right? Mm -hmm. I think, um, thank you so much for bringing that to light. Um, another component of the, of the framework that we really try to promote here is, you know, the importance of addressing life skills across the girl's lifetime. I mean, your paper really talked about, um, you know, thinking about interventions across key tipping points across, uh, across adolescence and, and how um, support needs to be targeted at those particular points in time. Um, I think maybe we can use that point to get to maybe Sesame Workshop with Abby. Um, Sesame Workshop is focused on the early childhood years. 
Um, so can you speak a little bit more about how your work or how you see your work um, on building girls' skills and girls' life skills at a young age builds the foundations um, for empowerment across a girl's lifetime? And you know, in particular, what are the consequences of not addressing those skills, um, those knowledge, is, or sets of knowledge and attitudes mm -hmm. at that time in her life? Yeah, definitely. I think I'll start with, with the last part of that and say that, you know, I think in, in general, um, we believe and, and research tells us that it's much easier to establish a, a, behave, a behavior than it is to change a behavior. And so we sort of have the, this luxury of when we're, we're working with young children, that if we can mm. effectively establish the, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes, I keep wanting to say knowledge, attitudes, and practices, but the knowledge, <laughs> skills, and, and attitudes that we think will, will set children on um, a, a positive trajectory, that then you don't have to worry about undoing something later on. And obviously, at the same time, you know, you're know, you hoping that you can influence some of the, the broader societal factors in a way that creates a conducive environment for these positive trajectories. And so it's, it's certainly complicated. But I do think that in, in some ways, um, it's, it's, quite, it's a bit easier to work with the youngest kids. And they're just really eager to learn and to try something new that they've learned. And you don't have to necessarily convince them that the way they've been doing something for the last 10 or 20 years is, is not the best way. And so we, we have that, that advantage a bit. Um, then on the other hand, you have these young children who don't necessarily have control over many aspects of their life. And so now going back to the earlier part of your question, I think what's really important for us is that we're thinking about, you know, what are the KSAs that young children can control? You know, where, where do they have agency and where don't they? And how can we make strategic decisions to build on what they can control and to empower them in those spaces without being unrealistic about the fact that we're talking about a, a six-year-old child here and, and what can we really expect them, them to be able to, to control and change it in their daily lives. So I'm going to um, give an example of one of our health education programs. And before I begin, I'll say, um, one, of the, one of the topics where personally, in many of the contexts where we work, where I feel less comfortable is in nutrition. When we're talking about you know, um, the importance of eating a diverse diet, or drinking plenty of clean water, or um, you know, having, having your colorful fruits and vegetables every day, that young kids don't necessarily have control over the food that they can access. And so you need a really effective partner or you need to know that the kids are in a context and that their daily reality allows them to access these diverse food sources before you start really spending a lot of time and energy and, and funds, frankly, on, on that sort of education. Um, a place where we have been able to do this work, and again, it's going to be a, a, in the health space, is in our water sanitation and hygiene education program. And there are a couple of reasons that that has worked so well. So our program is, is called Wash Up, and it's, um, you know, it, it's really focused on, um, on the, all of the KSAs. What we really <laughs> want to see at the end of the day is, is positive behavior change. And the way that, that we made a decision to really invest a lot of energy in this space is that a lot of the behaviors that can help to save lives and prevent disease, you know, children can, with access to the appropriate resources, they can practice them themselves. And so that's around, you know, making good decisions about what water you drink and what water you don't drink, um, knowing how to properly wash your hands with soap, um, wearing shoes or sandals when you go outside to use the latrine, that kind of thing. And we have a great partner in World Vision because they're actually working on the infrastructure side of things. So when we partner with World Vision and we're working in public schools where World Vision is working, we know that there are improved latrines. We know that there is access to safe drinking water. We know that there are hand washing stations at these schools. And then we know that these kids can be empowered to practice these behaviors. You know, They have the opportunity to practice what, what they're learning. 
And I think it's really important to just sort of keep that in mind, that, that you're empowering children with, with knowledge that they're able to use for whatever age they're, they're at. And that's something that we definitely try, that, you know, we definitely try to do. Uh, another thing that, we, that we're trying to do with the WASH program is to empower children to be educators themselves. So we actually have a, uh, a whole chunk of the curriculum is dedicated to this idea that you can go home and you can teach your siblings about something. You can go home, well, in, in some countries, you can go home and you can teach your parents about something. And so we, are, we make those decisions on a country by country basis, working with local stakeholders to make sure that we're not encouraging any sort of um, empowered practices that would be seen as disrespectful from such such young kids, but that we're really trying to give these children a voice and let them see and let them see through our characters as well that young children can teach one another and they can inspire behavior change that can have a positive impact for for their communities and for for actual health outcomes. So, um, yeah, it's I think. I think that I'll probably stop there, but just really briefly, I'll, I'll mention that while we have, we do work with quite young children, the WASH program is, is just beginning to expand, and actually this week we have a curriculum seminar that's running in Harare in Zimbabwe to figure out how we can create an, a curriculum that integrates WASH education with girls' empowerment and menstrual hygiene management. And that'll be targeting girls who are ages 10 to 12, as well as their, their peers who are boys and their educators. It'll be a school-based program. And we're, we're, again, sort of trying to empower kids with this, this knowledge before they necessarily need it. You know, we do know that the 10 to 12-year-old girls in these rural contexts where we're working typically have not started to menstruate. And so we're actually trying to prepare them up front before um, they, they begin to practice or begin to hear things that aren't necessarily true, aren't necessarily the healthiest way to deal with menstruation at school. So. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that one goes, and hopefully uh, in a year or so, we'll have some very positive news to share about that. It's a really exciting case of being able to see how the early childhood focus on skills um, beyond just the specific um, WASH skills, but even the negotiation and the communication with parents and other peers about what they've learned, like that piece, get connected to a really critical point in, I think, what we all um, are familiar with around puberty and adolescence for girls. And um, when we talk about the menstrual hygiene um, uh, management programs that are trying to address um, puberty-related issues for girls at adolescence, there's this now a, a potentially a link um, from early childhood to that point. So it's really exciting I to hope hear so. that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Isa, over, over to you. Um, how does the focus at BRAC um, on livelihoods help, help us to think about ensuring continuity from adolescence into um, adulthood and, and those, those life outcomes that we're really trying to um, see happen after Girls Leave programs? Right, so the country and um, the context in which we work, um, they face many challenges related to sort of population growth and um, the increase, increasing number of young, young people who have to enter the, the labor market. For women and girls um, where we work, uh, these, challenges are, these challenges are sort of harder to address because they also occur alongside um, a relative uh, uh, lack of economic empowerment and also uh, control over their bodies. You know, there's poverty and then there's relative poverty. Um, for us, I guess that's why we keep on coming to this focus on, on women and girls. So, so to improve um, life outcomes um, for girls into their adult food, we sort of address the ways in which their economic empowerment converge with uh, reproductive rights and, and, and empowerment. When adolescent girls don't believe that um, they will eventually be able to have access to employment opportunities or other livelihood opportunities. Um, they don't really invest or compel the investment into their education or their sort of skill 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 based program. And this then uh, the outcomes this lead, leads to is like child marriage again, um, transactional sex in some instances, young childbearing, and vice versa when um, they do enter into early marriage and they have children young, then they're less likely to sort of be able to take, take advantage of opportunities that sort of present themselves. Um, and this 
we find creates this cycle of um, economic and social disempowerment that follows adolescence um, into adulthood. Um, so disadvantaged girls, poor women. So working back um, for us, the ELA approach then is to sort of focus on livelihood skills for adolescent girls. Um, and alongside sexual or reproductive health training, um, confidence building, mentorship, and access to mic, mic and access to sort of microcredit where appropriate. And we think um, by doing so, uh, by focusing on, by wrapping those two things together, uh, doing the work that you need to do in life skills, doing the work that you need to do building social capital for the girls, and wrapping it up with financial empowerment tends to break that cycle. So then um, it carries it carries along it carries on with them. Um, it follows them from their adolescence into adulthood. Thank you so much. I think the piece about you know breaking the cycles that really gets back to the point about at what point do we break the cycle, right? right? Do we focus on it at early childhood? Do we focus on it in adolescence? And how do we do that so that to ensure that those life outcomes when they are women have already been those those cycles have already been broken? Um, so I, I want to make sure we go, have time for for audience um, questions as well. Um, before we do that, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, we've. Your, your, your discussion points have all really helped to um, make more practical and tangible some of the abstract concepts that I had presented earlier. And I wanted to get a sense of from you all in thinking about moving forward. And we have a lot of um, uh, practitioners and policymakers and um, researchers here in the, in, in, in the field here in our audience. Um, what would be your recommendation, um, to, your, your one recommendation, <laughs> to help uh, programs really think beyond the girl in our efforts to achieve wider social change for girls. Um, maybe, Armin, we can start with you and come down. OK. Uh, we have a whole room full of people who are advocates for girls, promoting girl, adolescent girls' education. I would say we need to promote adolescent boys' behavior change. Uh, you know, let's focus, uh, that's what we are also planning to do. We can't leave the boys uh, out of this conversation. <clears throat> uh, boys need to feel a sense of responsibility uh, also in changing gender norms. Uh, also to feel that, you know, uh, girl, they're, they're both boys and girls are partners in uh, making a better world. And uh, a lot of the, the, the funding and the energy, I think, uh, in today's world is so focused on adolescent girls. You know, we, we keep on reading about the crisis. You know, I've also written about the, the learning crisis, and it's all focused on girls. But I think we, we critically need to bring boys into this conversation. We need to change their uh, ideas of masculinity. Uh, we need to, you know, uh, uh, we really need to target them. So that's my one great recommendation. And I hope many of you will uh, agree with me. Yeah. And I think as um, uh, Jean Sperling, Rebecca, and I have mentioned in the past, you know, this really requires a special focus on the girls without forgetting the boys. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that one. Yuki? Good. Um, I prepared something like before I came, but probably I would say like something completely different out of like what's prepared. So what I prepared is like um, like multi-sectoral interventions or creating enabling environment, um, including the boys or engagement of the boys and men, or partnership or like engagement of adolescents, not as beneficiaries, but also as a partner. That was like I was kind of thinking, but I would shift it <laughs> a little bit. I think like we just need to hear the voices of adolescents echoing uh, what Samin was saying. Um, how many of you working with adolescent or whole adolescent go to the field and talk to them and then hearing their voices? Good to see like many hands. I'm working at UNICEF and um, UNICEF says like the country office is the field office more or less like we are in the field. But our work is stuck with the ministries or partners or um, some administrative work in the office. How often do I have an opportunity to go to see the girls? or boys in the rural areas where we are working for. And then that is giving me the power. And then I think all the practitioners just see it. What are the challenges they are facing? 
hearing their voices, what's their support needs, what they are challenge, uh, facing challenges in the house or community or the schools. And probably this is giving us like something more based on whatever <laughs> else like we have, data or network or partnership. As I said, like we do have like all the um, means, but I think like we really need to see what they're thinking and then just lifting up some voices and then giving the opportunity for adolescents to be a change agent of the society. And then I think this is something like I want to um, take like one recommendation. Thanks. Abby? Sure. Um, it actually fits really well with what both of, both of you just said. Uh, I would definitely emphasize the importance of involving parents in programs. And of course, mothers are critically important, but fathers are very important too. And what I would say that we need to keep in mind, uh, as many of us are working in um, you know, global or multi-country organizations, that what appropriate messaging and parental participation looks like, it might vary a little bit from country to country. And it's important for us to, to create programming that respects and reflects the voices of the, the parents who are supporting these these girls as they as they grow up, so I think you know just being a bit flexible in terms of what you know the the right kind of parenting engagement or the right kind of parental involvement looks like is is very important. But making sure that you know we are open minded enough that we can adapt maybe some initial intentions in order to keep parents involved and to not maybe fall back into something that's a bit easier, which would be you know focusing solely on on the girls themselves. Lisa, last word to you. Um, so for me. Um, from what I've seen with my work um, at BRAC, uh, I would just echo an increased focus really on the girl. The numbers are not panning out. Um, I think for me, the question really always is, what about the girl? Um, uh, in many of the places that we work, uh, girls are the most disempowered, girls have no voice. And it's because of that, that this question of, of um, in many of the communities, and we do get those questions as well, right, from community leaders and boys and men in the communities where we work, what about the boys? When really the question is, what about the girls? So for me, it's doubling down on our work with um, girls. But um, of course, uh, because we're working with girls, sort of um, creating and focusing in our programs more on creating um, enabling environments where the girls will live. And of course, the enabling environment for a girl, it involves the boy, it involves her brother, it involves her parents, it involves her teachers, it involves uh, other power brokers in society. Mm. Um, I, I think many of our programs can have stronger focus on, an, an, mm. on um, creating an ena enabling environment. Right. Thank yeah. you so much. So let's go over to the audience. We have, uh, we'll, take a, we'll do a couple of rounds. So I'll do um, one in the purple and then one right there, and then uh, Andrew in the back. Hi. I, this hadn't been talked about until your comment, Abigail, touched on it a little bit, but it's quite obvious, I think, it's intuitive to everybody to know that mothers are really important influences. But And I'm a practitioner, so I don't really know much about how this fits in the world of research, but maybe different researchers here could address what uh, President Joyce Banda, the former president of Malawi and the second only African woman president, uh, has found and has been advocating for. She has found that in studying female leaders in Africa, the most important common ingredient was them having fathers and fathers who supported them. Thank you. Hi, um, I work for CARE. Um, one of the series we have at CARE is Failing Forward trying to learn from the mistakes or unintended consequences of our interventions. So I'm very interested in hearing a bit more of what have you learned from some of the unintended consequences of some of your programming. Because I can anticipate with each of you that some of the things you, though well-intentioned, and some of the assumptions that you base your interventions on actually resulted in some not-so-positive things. Thank you. And, and one more from Andrew, and then we'll do another round. 
Um, hi, I'm Anju Malhotra. I'm Principal Advisor, Gender at UNICEF, and um, great to see Yuki on the panel. And um, my uh, statement is a little bit more of a comment than a question, but there is a question at the end. Um, I, I'm uh, thrilled about the passion that you all bring to your work, and uh, there, are, there are some very important investments that you have made uh, in moving the girl for agenda forward uh, which is obviously delightful. But um, I can think of in the 25 years in which I have been working with life skills programs and adolescent girl program, probably maybe 80% of life skills programs um, have not worked, have not been sustainable, have been left aside not to be scaled up, and it not even implemented effectively. The ones that are implemented effectively are usually channeled by dedicated um, NGOs and uh, committed people like yourselves who put their heart and soul into it. Because to do a good life skills program requires people who's, uh, who are going to do, to do the um, teaching and the training and the systems and the setup and good resources. And if you're going to have a holistic program, you also need to work with the communities and the boys and the men. It requires a lot of money. It requires a lot of infrastructure. Um, so, you know, we have been reconsidering and to the point of unintended consequences that maybe in our passion we're creating too much of a divide between what the NGOs are bringing and the committed people are bringing to the table and what our systems are delivering, what school systems are delivering, what uh, social protection systems are delivering. And in some ways, perhaps it's time to think about um, having your passion actually influence those systems and to the point that she was asking, you know, beyond the girl, what can we do? How can we have girls actually have serious access to good teachers, good schools, schools that are not too far away, um, schools that actually teach life skills as part of uh, what they're supposed to teach? Um, and and where, where do we um, channel our energies instead of being the delivery point? Um, but rather than the voice that really changes it for millions of girls because at the end of the day, the number of girls that you're able to serve is not very large. And in that sense, I think that also answers the question of resources in boys because a lot of people talk about influencing boys, but if you look at the amount of resources that are going to boys versus girls, not through NGO programs, but through larger government and other investments, it's disproportionately more for boys. And why are we not using those resources to actually get boys to be better influenced? Because the worry about the comment that you're making is that we need to work with boys, is that those small resources that we're currently spending on little programs for girls will then get diverted to channeling boys. And her point, you know, girls have to be front and center. So it would be interesting to hear your thoughts about that. Um, are we really, ser really serving girls by taking our passion and directly working with them? Or are we really satisfying our own sense of having to do something and having that touch, um, touch point that Yuki mentioned? Is it for our own satisfaction or for the welfare of the girls? Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for getting us straight into that critical question. I think. <laughs> You know, the question of sustainability and um, scalability is definitely something that I think we should maybe address here as well. But that point about the division between what NGOs are doing and what the small pool of resources that are channeled into NGOs are doing versus the large set of resources that are going to large systems, how can we better merge these two? Um, I think that's a very critical question um, for all of our panelists. So we've got one on um, uh, on mothers and f versus fathers. Which how you know how do we um, reconcile the need to engage both? And um, we also have the question on unintended consequences and what you all have learned. And then that critical question of you know resources and um, where our efforts are with NGOs versus systems. So um, anyone want to tackle those? I can I can go for it. it. <laughs> Um, sure. So I'm going to try to cohesively address address all of those points. Um, what 
For us, um, what I would say in terms of cost effectiveness and scalability at Sesame Workshop is that certainly our broadcast programming allows us to reach literally millions of, of girls and children and, and parents. And it's certainly an, adv an advantage and it definitely has a much lower cost per per child or per, per recipient or beneficiary or whatever term we want to use than many other programs. And there are a couple of, of challenges that come with that. Um, one, of, one of the challenges is that not everyone wants to fund that. And, and certainly, you know, as a nonprofit organization, it's difficult to convince um, someone that the best thing that, a funder, that the best thing that they can do over the next several years is um, pay for a, a new season of television or a few new seasons of, of television programming. Um, so while it is, that is certainly scalable and, and does have some impact, I think it is a bit hard um, from the, the funding side of things. And I would also say that the, it links a bit to the, the question of like, where are we not as successful as, as we might hope we would be? And there are some limitations with broadcast. You know, it, a broadcast program, even if a child, even if you make sure that a child watches three times a week, and doing that has costs, of course, that are that are added costs. It's not it's not like broadcasting something guarantees that it will be watched, but you're less likely to achieve um, you're less likely to achieve behavior change. You know, you need to you need to have a program that appeals. To, to kids over the course of 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you know, depending how, how long the program is going to be. And that means that it's not going to focus on only one topic the entire time. Like no child wants to sit down and watch a 30 minute segment on the alphabet. And so you end up diluting the curriculum a little bit. And then while you might see some knowledge gains, you're much less likely to see like attitudinal shifts or actual um, behavior change or skills building. That you can that you can get when you're working with smaller numbers in um, you know a more interactive environment. So for for us at Sesame, I think that's a really important question. You know, what are we what are we trying to achieve? And really asking ourselves, when does it make sense to to try to achieve through broadcast? And know that you know even if all we do is move the needle on some of the the knowledge skills um, or the, no the knowledge levels, that that in and of itself is, is a worthwhile achievement because we're doing that among you know, a very large population versus when is that shift in knowledge not actually going to positively impact child outcomes? And then maybe it does make more sense to spend more per child on an in-school or, or community-based program. Um, I would link some of that to the, the parenting the parenting question about mothers and fathers. And I'd say that we have had much better luck um, engaging fathers through anything that involves media, like, bra like uh, television or radio, that you know, when we have really nice anecdotes or when we have some focus group evidence that fathers are influenced by our programming, it tends to involve video. And when we need a parent to come to a community center to engage in meaningful play with their child for two hours at a time, once a week for four weeks or once a week for 12 weeks, it is almost always the mother or an aunt that, that shows up with the child. And so I think that that is another thing just to have in mind that um, there are certain certain types of programs that might be more conducive to the involvement of, of, of fathers versus mothers. And that, that's likely to vary a bit from country to country, but we're working in three countries right now with the program I just referenced. And I think we've seen, you know, when we have a couple hundred families show up or a couple hundred parent-child pairs show up, maybe um, across the three countries, maybe six or seven of them will, will be fathers. Thank you. Others want to respond to some of those questions? Sure. Um, I was going to speak to um, the fail forward uh, question because we I do have a perfect example um, from our adolescent development work. <clears throat> so our work sort of started in Bangladesh in 93. Um, and in Bangladesh, we mainly do life skills. 
and we, 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 we um, implement our programs like we do most of our other programs. Uh, we implement them at cost and scale. Um, and it's large enough that the, the dollar amount per girl is uh, usually something around $30 to $40, um, of maybe over a two-year period. Um, in Bangladesh, it's mainly life skills. And uh, the way we do it, um, we, uh, we train. It's a trainer of trainers thing. We, we train our mentors, we recruit mentors, we train them, and then the mentors work with the girls. Uh, when we moved our program, when we moved into international operations, specifically to Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically to Uganda, which is where our first uh, African operation was, when we started our, our, our adolescent program there, we changed it a bit. We added the financial empowerment component, mm -hmm. and that worked extremely well in the Uganda context. And then we did Tanzania, South Sudan, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. We tried to backtrack that um, iteration into um, Bangladesh, and it failed. It fell flat on its face. Um, while, the, while we could work very easily um, with girls uh, delivering life skills, and it worked for the family, it worked with them in their communities, we found out that adding the livelihood training and the microcredit portion did not work. At least it did not translate into um, actionable, actionable empowerment for the girls. Mm. Um, we found out that in the Bangladesh context, um, perhaps maybe because patriarchy is stronger or maybe family structures are stronger, I'm not sure what it is, but um, the money ended up in the hands of fathers or other family members. So it, it just, it didn't work at all. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I tend to disagree with the last comment uh, in terms of uh, that we only need to focus on the girl. Uh, the terrific, uh, you know, incidents, the horrible incidents of sexual violence in India clearly indicate that we need to have a mind shift change in men. And we need to, uh, you know, educate men so, and, and if there's huge amounts of funds, I would love to know where they are. <laughs> so, you know, we can tap those resources. Uh, I, I feel that, you know, just, uh, uh, okay, we're all trying to empower the girl and we keep the girl, in, you know, um, in the main central focus. But then what's happening, you know, uh, I mean, what's happening in real life, in everyday life in our country? Uh, I'm talking from the Indian context. Uh, we definitely need uh, to target boys, definitely. Uh, and I, I feel very strongly that uh, changing boys' mindsets, changing boys' gender perceptions, changing their ideas of what masculinity is, uh, trying to change very deeply embedded patriarchal norms is very important. Uh, in terms of, uh, somebody asked about unintended uh, consequences. I'm not sure that I'm going to answer this, but uh, whenever we gave the scholarships, we always insisted, or the bicycles, we always in insisted that mothers came. But we started to see fathers coming. And uh, uh, the, the way we worked you know, to engage the fathers was through the mothers. So uh, when we gave the mothers microcredit loans, the fathers would ask for loans for motorcycles. So, you know, uh, you, you can, I mean, there are different ways you can engage uh, them. And in terms of unintended consequences, the Ashtanukai's initial uh, focus was only literacy for adult women. So, uh, you know, we struggled. Now, that was, again, a very top-down approach. You know, I read a book, a terrible, you know, only 39% of women are uh, literate. And so let's, you know, let's 100% uh, literacy, you know, let's start this campaign. And of course, it failed miserably. Uh, and uh, after two years, the women said, what are we going to do with your literacy? You know, maybe we can read a bus board. We need, we need income. We need to, you know, uh, uh, improve our financial situation. So very quickly, we learned that you need a bottom-up approach. What is it that the people that you are uh, you know, serving, what are their needs? You need to start from there. So that was a, a very uh, valuable lesson for us.
Just a quick mm, question. Yeah, um, I like the answer. I was just checking like the um, the data I have. So so far, um, UNICEF reached out like fifteen thousand parents um, for their parenting or orientation, and normally we call like both. But either of them comes like father or mother because they need to do like their own work. Um, I don't have exact number, but normally it's like more or less like half and half, interestingly. So the fathers also come um, to participate um, if they see like other fathers are coming because they need to show like they are participating. So it's kind of like social norms again. And then if the mothers are more, normally the father doesn't come. So like we need to create some environment how we want to engage like um, different gender parents um, to be uh, supportive for this program. So that's um, one um, answer. And then for the failing one, uh, it's interesting. I don't, um, I can't think of like anything failing, but like still when it comes to adolescent empowerment program, especially in the country or geographic area where we don't have much employability or employment at the end of the program, I feel um, it is uh, not very easy to kind of like raising so much expectations. And a lot of girls are asking us like, what's next? Mm. And then we might not have some answers, but at the same time, I think this is um, where um, the partnership works better. So in UN, for example, we do have other partners who is working for um, employment like ILO. Or um, there are some other partners, well, the bank crew is working like some other initiative or UNDP or um, civil society organizations. So I think like um, the partnership is a key to linking like whatever program we do and next stage. So that is, um, it's not maybe like fatal failure, but still like something we learn from um, the program. Anju, um, let's go on. <laughs> she is my big boss, so <laughs> it's very difficult. But um, I think um, scalability and then sustainability, um, it's, it's a really, really good question. And then this is something, the challenge. But um, as I mentioned, UNICEF tried to work through the system strengthening um, with the partners. How we do is, as I said, um, we made the 15, um, modules um, curriculum package with the um, consultation with the adolescent um, partners and the government. And then once they are involved, it can be buy-in. And then that um, project itself or the training materials itself is endorsed by two ministries, Ministry of um, Women and Children and then Ministry of Youth and Sports. But the total budget of these two ministries is like 0 0.09 or something out of like 100 total budget of the national. Mm. So who has the money is 26% um, goes to Ministry of Education. And a lot of girls are dropping out, but still quite a few of them, boys and girls, are still in the school system. So now we are trying to make sure that like education sector is taking some of the component within the education system so that like we can catch more adolescent girls and boys in the school setting. Um, I it say like school setting, but like I should say like education setting. So it's not only schools, but like out of schools. And then how we want to work with various ministries to catch adolescents at different variety of platforms or um, ways. Um, so um, again, like this comes to like multi-sectoral approach um, so that like we can catch um, adolescent girls and boys in the community at school probably like at health center or like somewhere else like where they come. And maybe like mass media also catch them. So it's not only like one approaches making the scale and sustainable. Mm, thank Thanks. you. So we are unfortunately now behind schedule again. No, but a wonderful conversation. And I think we should definitely pick up that question about the boys versus the girls, where are the resources? How can we really think about attending to the wider opportunity structures that are affecting the ability for, of girls to be able to translate their skills into empowered action? And that question of boys, is it, is it that we focus the limited resources that are within the NGO non-formal sector to boys, or is we really just focus on the girls and we think about how do we make the education systems more compatible with um, thinking about masculinities, thinking about um, gender relations and those other uh, social structures and policy structures that are in inhibiting girls from translating their skills into action. But we don't have time today, so I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, and we are going to just wrap up this panel and turn to some closing remarks by our director, Rebecca Winthrop. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. much.
you, you guys can leave, but my closing remarks are, are very brief because we have 60 seconds left before our reception. Um, so basically, uh, I just wanted to give a huge, huge thank you to all our panelists. It's been an incredibly rich discussion um, from, from the morning um, right through to today. So many thanks to all our panelists. And I want to give a particular thank you to um, our four wonderful, here they are all, I'm missing one, um, uh, Echidna Scholars. So uh, Maria Christina and Dasman and Damaris and Armin, huge thank you to all four of you. Um, we have loved having you here. You have enriched our understanding of girls' education across our team and certainly with a much Brighter, broader audience who you've interfaced with. Um, and sadly, this is the sad part, they will leave us and go back to their families, which they will be happy to do, um, I'm sure, but we will be sad. Um, so please do stay in, in close, close contact. And certainly you will have made many new friends who are here um, with you and will continue to stay in touch. Um, and I'm sure they will corner you when we have um, coffee, tea, cookies. We thought it would be a little too early to have wine. It's 3.30. Um, so just a, a big, huge thanks to everyone. And please join us out here for the reception.